Now, some very interesting findings out this week from the Sutton Trust, revealing that the number of youngsters who now think it's worth going to university has fallen significantly over the last five years. Out of 11 to 16 year olds, 75% think it's important to enter higher education to do well. In 2013, that figure was 86%. What do you think is behind the decline in students wanting to go to university? Is it simply down to cost and debt? If it is, call 0345 606 0973. Is it because there's no guarantee of a job at the end of the course anyway? If you think it's that, text to 84850. Or are you concerned about the political allegiances of some university staff? Maybe they don't want to be brainwashed, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC and it all starts next. Well, last week it was the A-level results, wasn't it? And some arguments about whether they've been made harder or easier and what compensations have been put in place. But rather than students chasing university places for the first time i think in a very long while it was actually universities chasing students universities advertising saying we're shorter people on this course and on that course and that goes hand in glove with a slight change in attitude you see just a few years ago 11 to 16 year olds were polled and most of them thought in fact, 86% of them thought that going to university was the right thing and would help them in life. That figure's now fallen to 75%, and the applications accordingly have fallen too. I have to say, I've felt strongly on this for years. It was Mr Blair, of course, that nice Mr Blair, who said he wanted 50% of young people to go to university. I always question the value of that. As a direct result of that, of course, we had to start charging people a lot more money, um, simple as. Um, and, I, 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 you know, I feel it's for, for many young young people um, a questionable benefit. That's always been my view on it. I'm also quite worried about the politics that exists within some of these universities. But let's go to Chris McGovern, former head teacher in North London and chairman of the Campaign for Real Education. Chris, good morning to you. Good morning, Nigel. So are you surprised that fewer young people now see university as the right way forward? Well, I'm not surprised because the reality is that uh, going to university doesn't suit probably a majority of young people. I mean, it's good news that uh, more young people are aware of that these days, but still 75% of youngsters think they should go to university because they're persuaded that that's the best route. Schools, who seem to know very little about the world of work, push the universities. The government pushes universities. Uh, the universities themselves are offering all sorts of incentives. You, know, you get a season ticket for a football club, you get gym membership, you get a uh, free laptop. You know. So they're like the white boys. Of the, the <laughs> <laughs> Is this really going on? Well, they're selling it, you know, and it's, and, and, and it's all based, of course, on on the A-level results, and the A-level results have turned out to be a counterfeit currency. I mean, we, you can get into university now by failing all your A-levels. I think this morning some figures came out from one of the newspapers, and there are 68,000 places available for youngsters who have failed all their A-levels. So really? It's a pretty bad state of affairs. And what really worries me is that, uh, and, and I, by the way, I spoke to a conference uh, of university admissions tutors a couple of years ago now. I sat alongside uh, Professor Les Ebden, who's the man who, who for, the, for the government, is basically the admissions are. He's in charge of fair access. So mm -hmm. he's quite a big, quite a big thing. And, and I said to that conference that if they want to know what happens to half of their graduates, you want to go across the road to the local coffee bar because a lot of them are underemployed. It causes big silence in the room. But what, and I said other things about these youngsters being led astray. They should be doing apprenticeships, on-the-job training, etc. But after that conference, three admissions tutors from quite important universities took me aside privately. Mm. They said, thank God you said that because no one else will say That's me. interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so are you telling me, Chris, that after 25 or 30 years of the public increasingly thinking that if their young son or daughter gets a degree in an ology, that actually that's not taking them forward very much? No, look, if, if you've got a bright academic youngster, of course going to university is going to maximise their potential. But, you know, I, mean, I was asked quite recently about a fairly new course, been up and running for a couple of years at uh, Nottingham Trent University. It's a degree course in heavy metal music. Now, I, 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 I'm sorry to laugh. Look, you know, you don't need to do. You don't need to be. Uh, 
uh, doing a degree to be a heavy metal rock music, and a lot of the support I, ga- I got came from the heavy metal music brigade. They didn't say, this is rubbish. You don't need a degree in heavy metal music to become a rock star or heavy metal musician. A lot of these youngsters are doing courses. They're not going to lead to employment, and they're going to lead to 50, maybe 60,000 pounds worth of debt. And, you know, they walk the green mile, really, to, to sort of unemployment or underemployment. No future. Lots of debt. Now, if we sent fewer... If we sent fewer people to university and we encourage vocational training, where, by the way, Chris, as I'm sure you know, there are massive shortages of people in this country who are qualified as engineers, nurses, and many, many other things. But if we sent fewer, could we reduce the levels of debt that people are leaving with? Yeah, and the thing is, a lot of these youngsters will never pay back their debt. They're never going to get a job which is going to allow them to pay back their debt. So we're building up even more debt. You know, at the the campaign for real education, we've said for some time that what we should really be doing, if we want to catch up with the most advanced economies, we should be having our GCSE exams at the age of 14. I mean, currently we're about three years behind the Chinese, the Singaporeans, the Japanese and our educational standards. We should have GCSE at age 14, and then we should have either an academic pathway for those going to university and a vocational pathway uh, for those who are not necessarily academic but we've got to get over the snobbery that somehow an academic is more important that, that, than should we say a, a plumber or electrician yes we, yes we, we need i mean london for example we need bricklayers to build the houses for the housing crisis you can earn over 100 grand as a bricklayer in london and we're, we're disparaging that and say they're all right i mean we've got this snobbery chris historian. we've got this snobbery haven't we in this country about people who want to learn trades and skills i don't understand it do you chris i mean i and, and i'm by the way I, I i really find a lot of what you've got to say very interesting very very refreshing because we hear too little of it is there any prospect of any of this changing in the next few years well, there's a slow awakening, and to be fair to the government, uh, they get most things wrong, but they are going to introduce what's going to be called a T level, which is going to be a technical level. But the problem is, you know, there's not enough, there aren't enough high quality apprenticeship courses available. There are apprenticeship type degrees, but there are only 10,000. There are 300,000 other courses, so there's not enough being done. And if there's a way of getting it wrong, the government generally finds it. I mean, the, the, even this morning we had a, a former Secretary of State, uh, Kenneth Baker, and I worked with him 30 years ago, so yeah. a long time ago now, but even he's now saying, you know, we've gone wrong because we, we, what we're doing, we're not catering for those children who are not necessarily academic. I mean, one of the reasons why we need immigrants in this country is because we haven't got the skilled labour. I know. If we could only educate our children yeah. into being the plumbers, the electricians, and so on, then we wouldn't need to have all the immigrants coming in to help us out. So it is a scandal. Is it going to improve? You must be joking. I've been working on this... <laughs> I'm, I'm a lone voice. You, the reason why you don't hear many people talking like I'm talking, because if you talk like I talk in the state sector, you lose your livelihood. Happened to me some years ago. I had to move into the private sector to teach. I've been taught in big comprehensive. So no one will speak in the profession. They're not going to speak up other than to say, look, everything's fine. Leave it to us. We're the experts. Well, okay. we've had enough of these, so, these so-called experts, and we need to get back to some common sense. The rest of the world goes along the two pathways, vocational and academic. You go to Switzerland, they start doing that at 11, they have grammar schools. And you go to China, they just started at 14. German start at... Sw- the, 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 most of these successful countries are having a vocational and they're having a technical. You go to Singapore, top of the league table internationally, they have polytechnics, as well as universities. We've got to have the two pathways. It should start at 14, and at 14, youngsters should be doing vocational or academic. No, it's very interesting. And Chris, finally, uh, Toby Young has written a piece in the Mail on Sunday, a very powerful piece, saying universities question mark they're the madrasas of the left and he's been talking about the sheer level of political bias almost brainwashing that's taking place in universities almost suggesting toby young and he is a tory but almost suggesting that tony blair thought by sending more youngsters to pc universities there'd be more labor voters it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, look, I know Toby Young, who was a pupil of mine many years ago. Oh, wow. He in Devon, and his father was a, was a, was a great radical education. And how was, he as a, how was he as a pupil? He's a naughty boy. <laughs> and he didn't do very well. I didn't teach him very much, but he was quite a naughty boy. But anyway, I think he's a notable figure now because he speaks against the grain. Look, the universe, we have a real, real problem in universities. I, I recall only a few weeks ago doing a program for Channel 4 television, and I was interviewed for the best part three or four hours, and they, it was about, about stats. There's a big problem in the universe at the moment. That should you pull down these statues? They don't oh, like yes. God, Kipling, don't like Rose. Big program about that. There's an hours program. They censored virtually everything, everything I said, almost. Because what I said, they couldn't answer. I said, look, we have got a problem in this country with statues, perhaps. But look, you, one of the most recent statues to be 
erected in London is of the Jamaican nurse Mary Seacole. Now, she's an important figure, deserves a statue, but she was a racist. She called the Turks degenerate Arabs, worse than fleas. She was a great supporter of the British Empire, and, and she was uh, quite happy to use the N-word, by the way. And I said, if you're going to present a program about racism, you've got to look at Mary Seacole as well, because she's a, she's a hero in many ways. But she didn't have these conformist views of the 21st century. She had the same views as Cecil Rhodes. The, because it was a different time. You know, only a couple of weeks ago, they, they, they painted over the, the Rudyard Kipling poem of the... Yeah. Leaf. When yeah. I was head teacher in North London, I used to give every leaver, every school leaver, a copy of that poem, because it tells you all you need to know about life now. You know, it, it's, it's censored, it's forbidden. Is it... Uh, and, and, and this... These, this desire in universities, is it the students that are doing this, or is it actually the lecturers that are pushing this? It's both, of course, and it's also the schools. I mean, the schools are coming through, the children are coming through from school. They're effectively brainwashed. We have a national curriculum for history. By the way, I have to write, write it with Michael Gove, so I know what I'm talking about on this one. It doesn't require the teaching of any specific event from British history, nor any personality, but it does require the teaching yeah. of West African history and Islamic history. So the children are getting... What, what I, I worked with some uh, of the black community in Lewisham, and they said to me, Chris, they said, the problem in our schools is that our kids, and there's a black community, Say they're getting a non-stop diet of slavery and deprivation, whereas the post kids at Eton and Harrow, they're getting Nelson and Wellington. Why can't we have a bit of that? Because that's how you make progress in society. Not just doing slavery, it's important, but you've got to do the other landmarks, and Britain is a great country, and children should learn about that. They should. Chris McGovern, thank you very much for joining us. Well, he was pretty plain-spoken there, folks, wasn't he? Chris McGovern, former head teacher in North London and chairman of the Campaign for Real Education, and he's seriously questioning, you know, the merit of university for many of our young people. I have to say, that is a view that I feel very strongly about. Um, you know, tell us tell us I'm right. Uh, tell us McGovern's right. Tell us McGovern is wrong. 0345 6060 973. And this business about political bias, it's not just here in Britain, it's in America. I spoke at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania earlier this year, doing a big debate against Vincente Fox, the former Mexican president. And I was told when I got there by security, uh, there are protests, Mr Farage, so come with us us and we'll take you in the back of the building. Oh goodness me, I don't know what's going on here. Although I'm fairly used to it. Anyway, I was later shown a photograph of the protests. It wasn't the students, it was all the professors with their big slogans, ban Farage from campus. What on earth is going on? Wouldn't it be right that our young people should be taught free speech and free thinking? Not that one point of view is absolutely right. I wonder whether that's why. In some cases, 18-year-olds who've got a conservative disposition, a centre-right disposition on the world, maybe think, I can't bear the thought of going to university because of the way they're going to speak to me, because of the way they're going to deal with me. I don't know. Let me know what you think. But for now, you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it is... 11.16. So the A-level results came out last week, and a lot of youngsters, those that got the grades they wanted and getting the universities that, that they wanted to are fine, others who may not have done as well as they'd hoped, uh, but are not finding it difficult to find places, and it's very interesting that Chris McGovern from the Campaign for Real Education said there are 68,000 places still vacant for those who failed all of their A-levels. Does it actually make sense? if people fail at their A-levels for them to go on to university, might people not be better off getting a trade, a skill, where well, they might actually get paid rather more than many of their friends who were going to university and coming out with 50 grand's worth of debt trapped around their neck. Or maybe you think, no, 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 McGovern and Farage are wrong. As many young people as possible should go to university to get a degree in heavy metal music. Um, you know, is it worth a £50,000 debt to get a degree in heavy metal music? I don't think it is, but please tell me I've got it wrong. I also wonder whether, actually for a lot of young people, it isn't about the lifestyle. They're going because they think it's going to be three years of partying and really great fun. I'm not against great fun. I'm very pro people having great fun. I'm just not very pro young people wasting three years of their lives. And that's what really worries me. Let's go, and by the way, if you've just got your A-level results, you know, let me know why you're going to university, why you're not going to university. Daniel is a first-time caller from Belter in Derbyshire. Daniel, good morning to you. Good morning, Nigel. How are you? I am well. So, are you surprised or not that fewer people now want to go to university? Not at all. Um, I'm a higher apprentice, um, slash degree apprentice. Um, I took a bit of time to make my decision. Um, 
in fact, I turned up at my first job after leaving A-levels in France the day of the referendum, uh, <laughs> told them the way I voted, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I didn't make many friends. But <laughs> That's OK, I've spent my life doing that. <laughs> uh, so, you're, so, so you're 20 years old now, Daniel? Yeah, so I've been uh, doing a, a higher apprenticeship for a year. Yep. Um, I, I, I took a bit of time uh, out to, to make my decision, as I said, but... Throughout my whole uh, A-level experience, I was told by my teachers, you must go to university, you yes. must go to university. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but what I found is when people had written off to university, uh, applied for their places, um, they got unconditional offers, and they stopped turning up to school um, <laughs> because they felt that they had got into university now, they, they need not apply themselves. Um, and yep. I, 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 I don't blame anyone going to university. I think there's a set amount of, of, of trades and jobs that do require a degree, but I, I, I would completely champion uh, becoming a, an apprentice at, at every single step. And, and can I ask, Daniel, the apprenticeship you're on, is this a government scheme or a private company scheme? It's, a, it's with a private company, yep. um, and from day one, I've been treated with with so much respect. I, I've I've been I've travelled the world. I get my degree. Wow. I get that part of of university work that and that university life and the social interaction that a lot of people would, would say is the, the preferred route for for, for them. Um, but for their choice of university, um, I get a, a good wage for my age. Um, I, I get a lot of support. I'm on a pension scheme. I, I'm looked after completely. Mm. And, and so, no regrets, Daniel. Missing university, good decision. Uh, I I wouldn't go to university. <laughs> okay, terrific, Daniel. Thank you very much indeed. Interesting, wasn't it? There's somebody who's you know been pre and wasn't it interesting. He made the point Chris McGovern made. Pressured, pressured, pressured. Told at school you must go to university. He's out there doing a private company apprenticeship. He's studying at the same time. He's even on a pension scheme. Doesn't sound bad, does it, really? Um, Calperna is a first-time caller from Wembley. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Um, just wanted to speak to you about my daughter. Yeah. Who's gone through the A-level process. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, missed out a medical um, place, um, a medicine place, um, for four marks on maths. Mm. Well, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be tough, can't it, this system? Well, it's, it's <laughs> you know, she's had to go for, for medicine. Um, you have to go for a tough process um, to to get to this stage. Mm. And then and then to turn around and say you've missed out by three points, you just get an unsuccessful on your UCAS um, application. Mm. Um, pretty upsetting. Um, we've had to go through the remarking situation. She's not eaten for four days. Um, she's been crying. She's really upset because she's built herself up to, you know, and the government is saying, we want, you know, um, doctors. Um, you know, she's British born and brought up. Um, should be the ideal candidate. Isn't, isn't the um, answer, isn't the answer for her to retake these exams? For four marks? Yes, absolutely. I mean, isn't I mean? Look, I know this can be horrible. Th this can be horribly cruel. But do you know something? You know, all through all through life, there are a series of events that take place where you either win by a bit or you lose by a bit, it, and it can be pretty horrible and pretty hurtful. And when someone's eighteen years old and they've set their mind on something, it's pretty heartbreaking for them. And I understand. It's very heartbreaking, yeah. <laughs> but, and but, the thing is, you have to if, if, to repeat it. You'd have to spend a year out of. Um, Mm. Uh, you know the um, the, the education um, system to just do this one exam again. Um, crazy. I think the universities, yeah. the universe, universities should look at it holistically because it's not just the exam that she's um, done and for four points. Um, uh, she's um, she's had to do the interview, the application form, um, the personal statement, and a UK CAT. Um, she's got a very high score, um, and, um, you know, work experience, she's done it all. And then for this, I mm. mean, they should have a, a system like America, where you get offered based well, on your results and stuff, and then um, whatever happens, you, you go straight well, in, it's, as she, long as you've had your offer. Yeah, she's fallen into a very, very tough place, and I'm sorry, but I... 
there must be ways that you can retake A-levels in a few months' time. There are ways you can do it. I don't know what it costs to go through that, but she certainly wouldn't have to wait for a whole year. It may be another year before she goes to, on to university, uh, but hey, she could find a job during that period or whatever. But I do think, Calperni, or, um, listen, here's me giving advice to universities, but I do honestly think, if this was my daughter in this situation, I'd be saying, look, it's horrible. You've set your heart on it. Let's find a way to retake these in a few months' time. That's my view. Capona, thank you for your call. And, you know, it's true, isn't it? Life is like that. You know, it can happen at GCSE. It can happen um, at, at, at 18 with A-level. It can happen because you get picked for the football team or you don't get picked for the football team or you win an election or you lose an election. Life, But life is full of these kind of incidents where sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, and it can be very, very cruel, hurtful, and unfair. That's a case of somebody who wants to go to university but can't quite get the degree that she wants. But many others are saying, do you know what? We're going to university because everybody else is. We're going to university because it's going to be a party. We're going to university because our teachers are telling us we have to. And some are beginning to think, is it worth a £50,000 debt for a degree in heavy metal music? Let's go to Lorraine in Chelmsford. Lorraine, good morning to you. Good morning, Nigel. Thank you for taking my call. It's Not a bit. To speak to you. Um, being the cynic that I am... Right. I, can think of, <laughs> I can think of five reasons why the Blair government pushed for the kids to go into university. Right. One, indoctr indoctrination. I'm going to come. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come to that in a moment at a bit more length. But so I'll pass on that for now. But one, indoctrination. Yeah. Two. To um, manipulate the employment figures, the unemployment figures. That may have been valid then, but now, with unemployment at the lowest since 1975, it wouldn't be. Mm. Three? At the time, I was talking about when the Blair came. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, no, I get that, I get yeah. that, but it, but it wouldn't more, be so relevant now, yeah. More jobs for the EU to come in at a lower standard, where the, our leavers would have, would, take, would have been taking then jobs. Mm, what, what, because they wouldn't have had... OK, I'm not sure, go on, four. More um, in debt to the bank. More I feel, I feel like I'm being examined bank. here, you know. <laughs> more in, more debts to the banks, yeah, right. Yeah. And it's big, 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 big business for the universities. It's all about money. Well, I think, uh, yes, I mean, the universities, of course, uh, the, uh, money matters to them hugely. And, and um, uh, of course, they get some money from the European Union, although, albeit it's our money that's been recycled. Um, Lorraine... If you had, if you had an eighteen-year-old boy or girl right now who wasn't particularly academic and didn't know what they wanted to do in their lives, would you recommend university? My son is a scaffolder. He's twenty-four. Yep. Many of his friends went to um, university and they've come out and they're working in coffee shops. My son is on one hundred and seventy pounds a day. Yeah. So he made the right choice, Lorraine. He certainly did. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Lorraine. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? You see, actually, and the earlier caller said a bricklayer in London can earn £100,000 a year. I'm guessing to do that, they're going to have to work pretty damned hard and have their own company and employ a couple of people. But, hey, there is real money in trades, folks. Real money in trades. And it'll last you for decades. And yet, we seem to think, through our education system, oh, no, 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 you absolutely must go to university for reasons that I simply don't understand. I'm going to talk in a moment a little bit more about political bias within universities and I wonder whether that might be putting a few people off too. I think we've got a real problem that we're, that we're not teaching our youngsters critical thinking. I'll come to that in a moment but for now you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC. It is now 11.30 and... Before I get back to universities, a report from a team at Edinburgh University, and they've written something called the Journal of Cleaner Production, and they are suggesting that some farmers are throwing away, dumping up to a third of the food produce uh, that, they, that they have to sell. And the reason is very, very clear. It is because of EU regulations 
that emphasize the cosmetic appearance of fruit and vegetables as opposed to their nutritional quality. This applies across 12 different types of fruit and vegetables. Now you've heard all the stuff about bendy bananas, you've heard all the stuff because we don't grow them here, but the curvature of cucumbers directive, I used to carry a copy of it round with me, uh, and you can't sell apples that have got certain marks on them or a certain sizes, so we're dumping, some of these farmers are dumping a third of their fruit and veg production. That strikes me as being absolute, complete and utter madness. I'm going to suggest to the pro-Remainers, maybe a benefit of leaving is there'll be more fruit and vegetables to buy, it'll be cheaper, it just won't be quite as pretty. Now, on to... Onto the universities. Uh, well, we've talked a little bit about debt. We've talked a little bit this morning about degrees in heavy metal music. What about this for political bars? And this really, really worries me. And again, I, I mentioned Toby Young earlier, uh, founder of a free school and, 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 and you know, quite a well-known educationalist. And, and he, he, he writes this this morning, that a survey done in 2015, which appeared in the, in the Times Higher Education Supplement, found that 46% of university employees intended to vote Labour. 22% intended to vote Green. And that only 11% were Conservatives. And guess how many were UKIP? 0.4%. That in a year when UKIP got 12.6% in a general election. So, uh, you know, it is politically way, way, way stacked to the left. Now, you may say that doesn't matter because a professional can admit they're to the left, but actually act in a way that gives people both sides of an argument. Jack Dorsey from Twitter was on CNN yesterday. He said, well, we are, of course, as people, we are on the left at Twitter, but we try to make sure that what we do is in the centre, though that is very open to question at the moment. But this is even more shocking, isn't it? You know, the no-platforming of speakers. Jermaine Greer, been no platform. Peter Tatchell has been no platformed. And I thought most shockingly, Dr Adam Perkins, a lecturer at King's College London, and he was prevented from talking at a university because he wanted to give a speech entitled The Scientific Importance of Free Speech. That was banned. What the hell is going on? Surely the whole point about university is you say to young people, here's a problem. Here are two solutions. You make your own mind up which of those you think is the right approach to life. It's called critical thinking. Without it, we are not going to produce people who are fit to live in the world. And I, I've had this row with Nick Clegg. You know, I genuinely think we're virtually brainwashing young people through our universities. And I think that actually is putting some conservative-minded people off going to university. I really, really do. Tell me I'm wrong. 0345 606 0973. Let's go to the Devon town of Dartmouth and speak to Archie. Archie, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. How are you? I am well. So, fewer youngsters want to go to university. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, Archie? He's gone. He's gone. Oh, dear. I think he was sort of walking along the beach from the sounds of it, wasn't he? <laughs> um, Daniel is a new caller from Basingstoke. Daniel, good morning. Morning, how are you? I am well. So, is it vital to go to university? Um, I think certain subjects, I think it's, it, it's good. Say, for example, if you're studying like physics or something on those lines. Yep. But I think for a lot of subjects, I don't think it's really needed. I mean, I um, left sort of um, college at AS levels. Uh, I'm 23 now. I was a bit lost when I left, um, but didn't really get on with um, the whole sort of system. And so I worked my way between industries, went from marketing, um, then took a U-turn to fashion, now I've ended up in finance, and um, it's worked out really well. Um, but I think it's a lot more valuable going into industries and sort of working away from the bottom as such. And those four years um, that you spend at university, um, personally I think it would be a lot better spent um, out in the working world. Yeah, a lot of people are told, though, Daniel, that to work in finance, for example, which is where you are now, to work in finance, you've got to have a degree to get accepted in the first place. That's the argument that's often put. Um, well, I started um, right at the bottom, where I was making sort of 230 calls a day, um, and just basically grinding as hard as I could and grafting, and then I've worked my way up the sort of uh, the pole, so to speak. So, I mean, I, I think, to your point, it does take a bit of luck. I mean, I was quite lucky to get the interview in the first place. Yep. And it, did, it did take a good hundred or so um, CVs sent out, but I think if you put the hard work in in the long run, 
Daniel, Daniel, I can't believe what I'm hearing. You're a 23-year-old who believes in graft and hard work. I know, it's strange, though. It's really, really odd. I thought the world owed you a living. I thought it would just all come to you without doing anything. <laughs> well, the, the, the only thing is, actually, yeah, I mean, just one more point, if I might. Yeah, the, could do, uh, please. I'm enjoying yeah. this. Yeah, I'm actually, um, I've got one of my friends on I, at, at my job. He studied economics, and he was struggling to get a job after he, after he finished university. And um, we got him into my job, and then I got headhunted for a new finance job and got him into that one as well. Um, so, so it just shows, I mean, he was really, really struggling, and it's almost, in some cases, um, about who you know. Do you know what, what, Daniel? You make your own luck, uh, and networking, and being out there, and meeting people, and remembering people's names, and be and turning up on time for meetings, and being turned out looking respectable. And you know, everyone thinks I sort of come from Victorian England when I suggest these things, but but I tell you what, it makes a heck of a difference. I wasn't. I mean, I didn't go to university. I chose not to. I chose to go straight into. Uh, straight into the commodities uh, business when I was 18, and I've never doubted for a moment that for me and my personality, it was dead the right thing to do. Daniel, great call. Keep grafting. Keep working. That was great. That was encouraging. Francis says on Facebook, I got into nursing without a degree in the early 1980s, and I am the best that there is. Francis, that's extraordinary. The Muhammad Ali of nursing there on Facebook. Hazel says, bring back technical colleges and apprenticeships. They would be far better than a university degree for some people yet by the way folks i am not saying people should not go to university please do not take that for, there are many many people for whom it is absolutely the right thing for them to do however i think there's probably half the number who were doing it because everybody else is doing it um, and their peers are doing it and it looks like fun and they're not i don't think really advancing themselves i get on sms the idea that 18 year olds should borrow forty thousand pounds to obtain a degree that may prove worthless appalls me universities have become first and foremost revenue raisers supporting wholly unnecessary jobs bad bad economics period says mark in scarborough who's clearly been taking english lessons from donald j trump the kind of thing that he would say um okay i met a chap that was annoyed he couldn't get a job in engineering management even though he had a degree in medieval poetry <laughs> <laughs> universities are a waste of space says steve well the old argument was of course that if you had a degree in classics even though that may not be directly applied to the job that you went for but your mind was disciplined and your mind had been trained and i suspect if you're doing if you're getting you know a first in something like classics your mind probably actually is very adaptable but for many people for many people doing degrees that are not as high up the academic spectrum as that as, as that i don't think they're really helping themselves my nephew's 24 he works in the london area as a bricklayer working for a contractor he earns up to two thousand pounds per week well there's a bit of evidence backing up what we heard earlier but that would of course would include getting up early in the morning and working hard um it does seem uh, and i've employed a lot of, of, of graduates and non-graduates over the course of the last 25 years and and i have I have to say had some graduates who thought that actually you know being in at half past seven in the morning and getting the coffee for the boss was not what you're supposed to do in life well i was brought up differently let's go back to uh, dartmouth and see if archie is able to speak to us yeah. archie hi i haven't listened to you nigel and i've got to say i agree with everything you said i came from a family of five yep and the, the three of us lads were uh, were written off as duffers basically i, I had some learning difficulties with dyslexia which wasn't sort of recognized in the 60s and 70s yes so i was written off anyway but my sister was a genius and she went on to university and she was a genius and she was one of the few girls in the whole area like a five mile radius that i knew that went to university uh -huh. and, and and she had the brains to do this and, and she went on and became a dyslexia specialist and a speech therapist so wow. it was a really worthwhile thing so she was right for university and it was the right choice for her absolutely however the three lads the three of us are all self-employed businessmen mm -hmm. we, we all we all monetarily have earned as much as she has and yet we were we were all written off because like you said we were grafters we had a focus we had a, a, a yeah. vision and we moved on it. I mean, I've, I've privately educated both of my daughters because of the experience I had in the education system in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it was, it was, I mean, it was pretty unsympathetic, wasn't it, to, pe to people who, who, who were dyslexic? Very, 
you had, you, yeah, I know that you had all these hippie type teachers. You had the old school guys who had the old, you know, the, the blue creamed hair and the leather patches who really made sure you learned a lesson mm. and, and had discipline. And then you had these, uh, I'm going to be your buddy, you know, flower power folk guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Archie, no Archie, I was at school in the 70s. I recognised both those types of school teachers very, very clearly indeed. Archie, do you, do you think there's too much pressure on youngsters to go and get a degree that may not help them? Well, I've got two daughters. My one daughter is just going off to a university now. She wants to become a surgeon. Yep. Uh, which is great. Absolutely. My daughter is a little bit more like me, not so much of an academic. She's been to a, a local agricultural college. She's got the, the sort of way with all to it, be able to speak to people. So sales is the, is the sort of direction she's going off in, which I think yep. is excelling. You know, it's, it's horses for courses, Nigel. Like it is. Say. No, absolutely. Archie, I thank you. Oh, there's a little bit of breeze on that mobile phone. Archie, who's done well monetarily, possibly calling from a yacht there in Dartmouth. I don't know. Good morning, Nigel. Here we are. This is one. Scrap all colleges and universities. All kids from 16 should do national service with the armed forces for five years. Comes from jo John, a truck driver in Kent. John, even if you were right, it ain't going to happen. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's now 11.46. Well, my question about the politics of universities is getting some response. Hi, Nigel. My name is Matthew. I'm at university doing history. All I will say, it's so PC, they say it shouldn't be political, but they allow societies on Labour and Lib Dems to exist, but not others. Sometimes I feel I just can't get more involved, as I have similar views to you, and as a young person who voted Brexit, I would be torn apart. It's just awful, isn't it? I think universities should be allowed, and all political views should be there. There should be freedom of speech. Keep up the good work, Nigel. I just find it... Ex I mean, it is not the first time I've had this, but you get young people, 19, 20 years old, scared to say what they believe for fear of what they'll get, not just from their peers, but from the lecturers at university too. William from Newcastle says, a lack of free discussion in universities, the demise of a state grammar school, has contributed to this lobotomised higher education system. Well, he says here, at grammar school, pupils were taught how to think, not what to think. There was a good social mix, not like the current apartheid between comprehensives and private schools. William, you're absolutely right. There is economic apartheid between the private system and the public system. And I, I went to a school where, in the year that I went, 50% of the boys that went to my school were there on scholarships. 50% came from, and they were means tested on this, 50% came from families, you know, at the lower end of the income scale. And that, I think, gave us greater social mobility. Let's go to Harry in Nottingham. Good morning, Harry. Morning, Nigel. Um, okay, so, in essence, like, when you go on about how left-wing universities are, it, it's a lot worse than you think. To begin with... Worse than I think. Thing, yeah, yeah, it's worse than you think. I mean, I'm calling anonymously for a reason. Okay. And, um, literally every single one of my lecturers, the first thing they said to us was, I'm a feminist, which is just... Oh, right. Uh, well, yeah. I don't see why we need to know that, frankly. One of my lecturers and added politics and um, was a revolutionary socialist and um, yeah, to the point where he didn't even vote for Corbyn because he wasn't left wing enough. Right. And the same lecturer. <laughs> That's us. pretty left wing, Harry, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. But um, the same lecturer pushed us to go. Um, you know when the um, university lecturers went on strike the other year for mm -hmm. better pay, etc. We were heavily pushed by this lecturer to go out on strike, even to the point of missing classes. He was determined to have us out there, you know, waving the red flag with him, and frankly, none of us were interested. But, I mean, we've had forms where we've been asked with gender, and what's included in this is something called gender queer, and there's up to 12 genders on these forms, and frankly, it's just a complete madhouse. We've got quote-unquote inclusive toilets, which allow people of these 12 genders as well, and it, it, it's just a nut house, Nigel. It's one thing, Harry, to have people who are nearly all of a left-wing disposition, and the fact that yeah. survey said 22% of lecturers voted green. I just thought it just shows you how out of touch it is <laughs> with normal life. But, but Harry, does it affect the way they teach? Because that's what matters, isn't it? Well, I'd say yes, it does, because, again, there's no real inclusion of right-wing opinions, but interestingly enough, it's tends to be corporate neoliberal right-wing opinions that are presented as opposed to nationalism or, you know, something that is opposed to actually caring about your own nation. The nation state's completely derided in these lectures. It's all open yeah. borders. It's yeah, 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 yeah. You think? Yeah. Do you and, know, there's I mean, a... 
There's a very funny piece, Harry, by Jeremy Clarkson in today's Sunday Times. Read it. And he says that he was at a dinner party and some young people were there um, at the dinner party. uh, And one of the adults said, well, I really do think we've got to get a grip on our borders. We've got to have proper immigration controls in this country. And one one of the youngsters started sobbing, sobbing. Uh, I mean, because they actually believe that if you believe in border control, you're some sort of neo-Nazi, because that's what they've been taught to think. Well, well, that could be the best of that. But interestingly enough, and the the students themselves, although you always get these, like, lefty virtue signalers, um, they're not as far gone as you think. I mean, I've had conversations behind closed doors, of course, of course, with numerous people where they totally agree with us. They totally agree with us. That might be a youth. Yeah. Screw it. Harry, we're losing you. We're losing you. It's a shame. It's a great call. Yeah, and sort of, Harry has to, it's rather like being a Roman Catholic, isn't it? In in Protestant Britain in the, in the sort of 18th century. You have to meet in private uh, because you've got these opinions. Nigel, I'm Sarah, a mature student who has a BA in philosophy and social psychology. I'm now completing my MSc. I asked my tutor why all the research papers I was required to read were so left wing. It made for an interesting debate. She said right wing is done through think tanks and is not recognised as academic. Mm, Well, I don't know. It's very, very, as she puts at the end of her note here, it's a very one sided form of education. We need to be teaching critical thinking. We need to be teaching people how to think, not what to think. That's what I thought. And that's certainly my view. I think we're brainwashing people. Uh, Neil is on from Manchester. Neil, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. So, have I got this right about about the lecturers all being way out on the left, or or am I exaggerating? Is this some sort of myth? Well, well I am a university lecturer, but, and I can say that where I haven't. Yeah, certain lecturers have certain views, but the environment I work in, I, I think everyone is open to debate, uh, and I have certain opinions, and my colleagues have certain other opinions. So. Uh, doesn't it depend a bit, Neil? Doesn't it depend a bit, Neil, what subject you're teaching? I mean, if you're teaching math, I mean, if, I mean, if, you're, if you're doing mathematics, for example, it's it's much more difficult, is it not, for your politics to come through in mathematics than it would be in history? I mean, I I teach accounting and finance, and yeah, I I would agree with within the well, the more scientific disciplines. I think people are are more open to. Uh, debate uh, and, you know, rational exchange of ideas, because those fields rest on those, um, you know, that that very activity. So, yeah, I, I can certainly say that maybe I'm fortunate that I, yes. I, I work in a business faculty. But, but, but do you see, Neil, do you see a do you see the problem that we're debating this morning? Uh, I mean, firstly, firstly, that, you know, to go to university and get a huge amount of debt may not help you in the in the workplace. And secondly, that there is just too much bias. Well, I, I mean, I think they're separate issue, issues. Okay. So, so one is an economic one. Uh, yeah, if, if you, what I would say as an educator, I would say to young people, if you're going to go to university because of the way, and I teach FinTech, uh, the way technology is shaping all fields, whether it's medicine, law, banking, Technology is disrupting all of them. So what I would say, if you choose to go to university, uh, you know, and so say you're interested in law or medicine, I would say that's great. Study that, but make sure you become an expert in, in whatever yeah. revolutionary technologies there are. And then you, you'll have huge opportunities. Yeah. Yep. So for some people it's right, but, but Neil, would you agree we may be sending too many youngsters to university? Oh, uh, I'd prefer not to comment on that. Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know. Uh, the honest opinion is, I, it's not. I haven't studied that. I, I don't know the facts, so I will refrain. No, from that's fair enough. That's fair enough. No, Neil, I thank you. Time for one last caller quickly. Catherine from Great Yarmouth. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Hi. So, university. Do fewer people now need to go? Because that seems to be they're now voting with their feet. Well, it's also what they're doing, and this is all about money. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the problem. Um, Medicine, you had that previous caller. Yeah. Um, The universities lose. um, uh, It costs them 30,000 a year to put a medical student on. It costs them two or 3,000 a year to put a surfing studies or a media studies person to a course. On one, they are losing 21,000 a year. 
when they get the 9,000 tuition fee, on the yeah. other, they're making five or 6,000. Uh, just, the, you, you were talking about the... Uh, are you saying, Catherine, are you saying yeah. that our, our, our 18-year-olds are being encouraged and driven towards some subjects to make universities more profitable? Well, that's why you can't get into medicine. We turn away a thousand students, including your the girl who yep. was turned away for four months. Yep. She's got three grade A's. Yep. Give you some numbers. Holland, the Netherlands, has two point six percent foreign doctors. Mm -hmm. We have twenty eight percent foreign doctors. Wow! And we turn away those thousand a year. We, as well, we have these universities, I mean, that 93% of them, but the uh, staff voted Remain. They almost all vote Labour, similar numbers um, for Labour. And yet you have the head of Bath Spa University got paid in 2017 a cumulative salary and benefits of £800,000. And she, so... Is there any, I mean, you, you've, you've, Catherine, I'm, I'm, Catherine, I'm running out of time. Yeah. Your driven by money point is fascinating, and your comparison of foreign doctors in the Netherlands and here, and we're turning a thousand away every year is amazing. Is there any hope of reform, yes or no? Um, yes, get out of the EU first. Um, get an actual conservative government that actually is oh. conservative. And well, tries well, I tell you what, I, I think university reform may well come before we get a conservative government that sounds conservative. Catherine, I thank, I thank all of you this morning. I'll be back tomorrow night at seven o'clock. At three this afternoon, it's Andrew Castle. Up next, it's Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Nigel.